Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we're going to discuss Prometheus, a titan who betrayed his own kind and joined the gods, the champion of humanity, the wily trickster who stole fire from Zeus, and the victim of one of the most truly diabolical punishments in all of Greek mythology, to have his ever regenerating liver ripped out of his belly each day and devoured by an eagle for thousands of years. First we're going to explore the role Prometheus played in the creation of humanity, going through various versions from multiple works. Following that, we're going to go through the escalating back and forth between Prometheus and Zeus, an exchange that results in a livid Zeus condemning his plucky, intrepid adversary to one of the worst punishments in all of Greek mythology. And finally, we're going to wrap up the video by looking at the story of Deucalion, Prometheus' son, specifically at how he builds a boat to survive a world-consuming flood unleashed by Zeus to eradicate humanity. Let's get into it. Prometheus was the son of Iapetus, one of the twelve first-generation titans, and of Clymene, one of the Oceanid nymphs. Born to them were four sons, Atlas, strong and unyielding, condemned to an eternity of bearing the heavens on his shoulders, Benthus, an obscure figure, smote by Zeus's lightning and thereby sent smoking down to Tartarus, Prometheus, wise and cunning, an ardent champion of humanity, and Epimetheus, dull and naive, whose susceptibility to temptation helped bring unspeakable suffering into the world. An alternative genealogy claims that Iapetus Consort, the mother of these four second-generation titans, was Asia, another of the Oceanid nymphs descended from first-generation titans Oceanus and Tethys. The Anthropogony, the genesis of humanity, in Greek mythology is an essential event. After all, where we come from is one of the core questions mythology and religion endeavour to answer, for which the details seem to have changed over the centuries. In Hesiod's Theogony, one of the oldest surviving works from ancient Greece, five iterations of people are described. Gold, silver, bronze, heroic, and iron. The golden race, created by the titans, was the first. They wanted for nothing. The world was peaceful and pleasurable, and when they died it was painless, like falling into a deep sleep. Next, Zeus and the gods made the silver race, by comparison to their predecessors weak, foolish, and sinful. They wouldn't honor the gods, so Zeus retired them and created the bronze race, but neither were they suitable inheritors of the earth. Yes, they were strong, but their strength wasn't tempered by wisdom, for they were brutal and loved violence. Again, their time was put to an end. The fourth age, called the Heroic Age, was a time of demigods, when the heroes of old roamed the land and performed deeds of great renown. Finally, the fifth crop, the people from whom we today would be distant kin, were created by Zeus, ushering in the fifth age, called the Iron Age. As you've undoubtedly noticed, Prometheus has yet to be mentioned in connection to the creation of humanity. This is because the versions that include him, at least the ones that have survived through to today, weren't written until hundreds of years after Hesiod's Theogony, a work released sometime in the last third of the 8th century BCE. Here's a passage from Plato's Protagoras, written around the 4th century BCE, that describes Prometheus, meaning foresight or forethought, and Epimetheus, meaning hindsight or afterthought, not creating humanity, but apportioning attributes that allow humans and animals to survive. Once upon a time there were gods only, and no mortal creatures, but when the time came that these also should be created, the gods fashioned them out of earth and fire, and various mixtures of both elements in the interior of the earth. And when they were about to bring them into the light of day, they ordered Prometheus and Epimetheus to equip them, and to distribute to them severally their proper qualities. Epimetheus said to Prometheus, let me distribute, and you inspect. This was agreed, and Epimetheus made the distribution, of claws and fur and other attributes. Thus did Epimetheus, who, not being very wise, forgot that he had distributed among the brute animals all the qualities which he had to give and, when he came to man, who was still unprovided, he was terribly perplexed. Now, while he was in this perplexity, Prometheus came to inspect the distribution, and he found that the other animals were suitably furnished, but that man alone was naked and shoeless, and had neither bed nor arms of defense. 
The appointed hour was approaching when man, in his turn, was to go forth into the light of day, and Prometheus, not knowing how he could devise his salvation, stole the mechanical arts of Hephaestus and Athena, and fire with them. Later, when Roman dominance had eclipsed ancient Greece, subsuming its territory into the empire, Ovid, a Roman poet who lived from 43 BCE to 17 CE, wrote Metamorphoses, his magnum opus. Though he is known for thinking the myths of the ancient Greeks were nothing more than silly stories invented by people of a bygone time, and though he's notorious for taking artistic liberties, particularly through embellishment, Metamorphoses remains the most comprehensive collection of Greek myths compiled in a single work. And in Ovid's telling, it is Prometheus who creates humanity. Here's the passage. Earth that Prometheus molded, mixed with water, in likeness of the gods that govern the world, and while the other creatures on all fours looked downwards, man was made to hold his head erect in majesty and see the sky, and raise his eyes to the bright stars above. Thus earth, once crude and featureless, now changed, put on the unknown form of humankind. Of Prometheus's story following his betrayal of the Titans, and following the creation of humanity, the events that follow, basically, him tricking Zeus until Zeus gets angry, chains him to a rock, and subjects him to unending torture in the form of a bloodthirsty bird descending on him and devouring his liver each day, are recounted in Hesiod's Theogony, which we'll now get into. When the matter of sacrifice was being settled between gods and men, meaning how the parts of animals would be divided between divine and mortal, Prometheus, ever the champion of humanity, interceded on humanity's behalf, bending all his cunning towards winning a favorable covenant for the people he so stalwartly supported. A great ox was killed and carved, and every part that constituted it was separated into two piles. One pile, the better of the two, contained the meat, but it was dressed up, covered by the stomach, so that the meat underneath couldn't be seen, making it appear unappetizing. The other pile, the worst of the two, contained the bones, but they were dressed up in glistening fat, making it appear the choice portion. When Zeus made his selection, he opted for the bones, disguised as they were, and henceforth, humanity enjoyed meat and bones were burnt in sacrifice. This ruse infuriated Zeus, who retaliated by withholding fire from humanity, forcing dark and cold upon them, prompting Prometheus to once again don the hero's mantle. He stole fire, transported it in a tube of fennel, and delivered it to the world. Thwarted again, Zeus was left livid. A fell mood fell upon him, one that would make his previous machinations seem mere trifles compared to the diabolicalness he had in store. Here, Zeus's retaliation was twofold, one part concocted to afflict humanity, the other a personal torture for Prometheus. He enlisted Hephaestus, the divine craftsman, instructing him to harness all of his skill and subtlety towards creating a trap for humanity, insidious and perilous. The smith god mixed earth and water to create a beautiful woman, the first woman, modeling his creation after the immortal goddesses. Athena was brought in to teach feminine crafts like weaving and embroidery, and Aphrodite to imbue qualities so as to make men desire her, and all the other gods imparted gifts too, which is why the name Pandora, which translates to all gift, was chosen. Hitherto, people had lived free of suffering and hardship, but soon a harsh new reality was to set in. Despite Prometheus's warning, which was to never accept any gift given by Zeus, Epimetheus was unable to heed his brother's advice, for he was utterly taken by the sight of Pandora, all those godly gifts woven into one woman irresistible to him. Pandora unstopped the jar, the jar in which all the pain and woe of the universe was contained. Only hope, by the providence of Zeus, remained in the jar when Pandora put the lid back on. The other half of Zeus's machination was the personal hell Prometheus was about to be dropped into. He was impaled in a shaft and chained to a rock by unbreakable bonds. Each day, a great eagle descended upon Prometheus, eviscerating him by clawing gouges with razor-sharp talons, tearing strips with a cruel beak, and devouring his liver. 
However, the truly diabolical aspect of this punishment is that it wasn't an execution, rather it was perpetual torture. For each night Prometheus's immortal liver would regenerate, so that each day he would be disemboweled and have his liver eaten again and again and again. Eventually, after an interminable time of isolation and anguish, 30,000 years, Prometheus is finally freed. First, Hercules kills the eagle that rips out Prometheus's liver each day in the course of one of his labors, and though this kindness was given without his father's consent, it was indeed a part of Zeus's design. And this makes sense because Zeus later ends Prometheus's incarceration as a reward for his sage advice, which was to cease pursuing Thetis, for it was prophesied that, sired by him, she would bear incredibly powerful children, more so even than their father. Interestingly, this wouldn't be the only time Prometheus would come to Zeus's aid in a matter involving incredibly powerful children. Zeus also learned of a prophecy whereby any children he sired by Metis would be incredibly powerful. First a daughter, wise and strong, then a son with the power to supplant him. Zeus swallowed Metis to forestall any such eventuality, but she was already pregnant when he committed to this preemptive path. Months later, an excruciating headache racked Zeus. Prometheus delivered him from pain by splitting his skull with an axe, and outsprung Athena, fully grown, donning armor, wielding a weapon. Another important myth in which Prometheus plays a part is that of Deucalion and Pyrrha. Perhaps the best known version of their story is told by Ovid in Metamorphoses. It centers on Deucalion, the son of Prometheus, and on Pyrrha, the daughter of Epimetheus and Pandora. The state of humanity had become so wicked and depraved that Zeus judged it to be utterly beyond redemption or salvation. The only course, he judged, was to expunge humanity, to scour them from the face of the earth and begin anew. His weapon of choice was all the water of the world, which he planned to raise so that all the earth was swallowed and every person drowned. Prometheus got word to his son, and advised Deucalion to build a stout boat and wait out the impending storm set to cover the continents and exterminate life as he knew it. With this forewarning, Deucalion and Pyrrha do as instructed and survive the flood. Zeus is eventually moved by the sight of the forlorn couple, seemingly abandoned by the gods and severed from everyone they once knew. The waters recede and the couple take shelter in a mountain cave. Several events ensue leading to the regeneration of the human race by Deucalion and Pyrrha, who throw rocks over their shoulders that turn into people when they hit the ground. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. As always, leave your video suggestions down below.